From the beginning when I studied with my master, he always said that we work with one force in the universe. There are one force cow in the universe. The force the creator, the force the creator, the primordial, the Wu Chi. The Tao that can be described is not the Tao. We are that which we are already seeking. We already are what we are looking for. As above, so below. We are a microcosm within a macrocosm. There's nothing more alive than the life force. 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 I come to the state about 1976. I teach in Thailand for a few years. The same thing, healing and everything for a few years. And the company manager on the printing machine and copier machine. And I also teaching the healing Tao. When I born is 1944. It's July 1944. And this time is uh, close to the end of World War II. And that time when um, Japan took over the Thailand and Thailand actually don't fight because they know that no way to fight. So they let the Japan in. So the Japanese, Japanese landed and, um, and they think that the Thailand side up with Japan because we don't fight the Japan. And when the Japanese stationed there, American come and bomb. So the whole Bangkok is bombing and my, my father actually been running into the jungle because it's Chinese. So the Japan, when they landed, first thing they wanted to arrest the Chinese see that they, they, they're spying on them to sending any information to China. So they said my father is one of the spies. So my father had to run to the jungle and he caught um, Marid, Maridi, Maridia. And their time, they have medicine, but in the war you don't get any medicine. So, and he, he's had Maria for a few years and finally died from the Maria right before I born. My background is oh, the whole family is a, a Christian family. I born in a church and uh, they don't bomb. After three days, we're going. My grandma hold me and go on a train to go out from Bangkok to another uh, province. So when the train get out from Bangkok, the American bomb, bomb the train. And uh, she hold me very tight. And because she holding me, her head hit on the on the window of the of the train and broke quite big. So every time when I I, I saw her and she said, "Look, this bump is for you. I hit this bump for you." In the Bangkok, I teaching in the evening, and I'm happy there. And that time also happened that an uh, American retreat from the Vietnam War. And my sister said, call me that you better leave because Vietnam started to take Laos and Cambodia. My sister said, you better leave. Uh, the Vietnam might take Thailand because Thailand used to allow the U.S. to have a base there, to have an air base there. From that, go and bomb Vietnam. So when my master said like, and my sister said like that, I said, okay, I will leave. 
she's a citizen and already petitioned me. So we just get the visa and everything and we come to America. And this is how we, we started. I stayed with my sister in, in Brooklyn. And uh, from there, I want to teach. I want to do the chi machine and I want to teach. Actually, I bring the chi machine from, the, from Thailand to here. So I started to want to market it and, um, and it's try to get a lawyer to get a patent and everything, but I cannot. It's so much work to do it. So I end up with teaching the healing Tao again. That's what I teach in the Thailand. And I studying in a Chinatown, renting a small place and study to teach the Chinese people according what I promised to my master, said I'm going to teach to the Chinese people first before I'm going to teach to the, um, to the Western people, which is know that I will eventually go around abroad and teach. So I ran a place, and it's um, in Bowery, that time in Bowery. And uh, downstairs, Bowery on the other side is very drunker. So every night, every morning, I have to clean their bowel movement, the urine, you know. <laughs> they just shit right in the door. <laughs> and I, I said, I moved. So I moved to the Canal Street. And I ran a place, it's quite expensive, very really tiny little place, you know. And one day I put, I put advertising that if you cannot open the microcosmic, I give you back money guarantee. So, so one day a psychology called, uh, uh, he's a Dr. D, Lee, Dr. Lee came. So he came to study. And uh, I, it seemed like he made it a long time, so I, 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 I helped him, everything. And suddenly he, oh, she opened in, in two days. You know? And she said, oh, I don't believe it. Okay? So if I said, I tell you, I come from one group of doctors, and that is a head by Dr. Young, Lauren Young. And he said, they have a money, a fund for research of the Qigong. One of my patients in Chinatown told me about him in 1979. What he taught my patient sounds like what I always knew. When my patient described his, his practices to me, that he learned from Master Chair, I knew that Master Chair is a teacher of authentic classic Taoist practices. And I noticed that Master Chair taught the same uh, system of Tao practices that I read up on in my high school days. And, and I continue to read more about uh, this system during my medical school years. This is Columbus Park, right in the heart of Chinatown. And every morning, the Chinese people come here to do the health exercises that we know as Qigong. This is where Master Chair started teaching 30 years ago. Every morning, the Chinese people come here and do the health exercises, something they have been doing for the last 5,000 years. If you visit Shanghai, uh, Peking, or Guangdong, you see in all the, the parks every morning, you see the, the Chinese people, uh, they actually get up 4 o'clock in the morning and doing these health ex exercises for, for 3 hours. They call it Qi Kong, and they have cured uh, cancers and other chronic illnesses over the years uh, without medicine or in combination with chemotherapy. For thousands of years, the Chinese don't have Western medicine in the way we know it. Even herbal medicine was developed slowly over the, the thousands of years. So how do, how do they keep healthy? Confucius lived to 75 years old. Uh, Lao Xi, 80 years old. They do health exercises, and they're still doing it and keep me healthy without too much medicine. From this park, if you walk along Bayard Street for two and a half blocks, very close. Here it is, Confucius Plaza. This is where Master Che started teaching Tao Yoga 30 years ago. This is where it all started.
I fulfill my promise to my master that teach to the Chinese people first. And after that, we met a group of people, Sharon Smith and the Raven, uh, Gandhi and around Diana, there's a whole group of people. I had practiced Tai Chi for a couple of years, and Chi, for me, was still a mystery. I didn't really experience Chi. Every now and then, I would have some kind of flavor or some kind of uh, a taste in my mouth or some, some like sort of passing experience, but I always thought it was because of the tea at the studio. I didn't realize that that was chi. And in retrospect, I know that that was my first taste of chi. I was a nightclub photographer in New York City, and I was the camera girl. And that meant that I took Polaroid pictures of people, and I sold them for $3 a piece in punk rock clubs. And that's what I was doing to make a living. Um, I was working almost every night, and I heard great music and uh, took photographs of all kinds of strange people. And so I had this extreme experience every night, and in the daytime, I had met Master Chia, and I was trying to meditate, and <laughs> it was kind of... It was kind of ironic, but uh, that, that's what my life was like. I'd had a lot of experience in the workshop field in psychology, and I had been trained in NLP and clinical hypnosis, and I had taken workshops and done workshops and taught workshops. I'd had uh, many years of experience in, in teaching, in classroom teaching at the universities. I was part of the early faculty at Interface in Boston and then also at Esalen and Holistic and New Age movements that were starting. <laughs> Ron was a dear friend. Our relationship went back uh, to the early days in Cambridge to actually the uh, late 60s. We met around that time. We were in the Gurdjieff work together for a number of years, and then I introduced him to uh, Taoist work. And then one thing led to another, and, and we met uh, Montak Chia. I had just heard about Taoism after seeking many different paths for many years. I only read books. I didn't have a serious teacher. I didn't think yoga was for me because I was a contortion dancer already and uh, had ballet from five years old and had traveled around the world with a dance partner doing acrobatic adagio lifts and tricks like you see on Dancing with the Stars. I asked the question to the universe, where am I going to find us? When I realized that Master Chair is a great communicator and a guardian of the ancient Taoist practices, I urged him to add a new direction to his teachings. Together, we planned our outreach strategies. We posted flyers on numerous free bulletin boards in the village. Those stu students of Master Chair were my friends, my patients. They were very ordinary Chinese people, Chinese restaurant workers who cooked or washed dishes. They were shopkeepers, Chinese laborers, and one was even a 45-year-old mother of four who was also a sweatshop sewing factory worker. They were very ordinary people, and yet they were able to feel the microcosmic circulating in them after a few short months of practicing with Master Chair. So they come to me and they said, look, I give you an offer. I said, I, when he said the offer, I said, I don't believe it. <laughs> okay, he said, we have a place for you. You don't have to pay rent. And that place, if you rent, is 1,500, that time is what? 35 years ago, it's $1,500 just for that place alone. Okay? We give you a place, you don't need to pay anything. Okay? No rent, nothing. All you do, you teach, and you don't have to find anybody. We'll send you patient. We rented a separate office in the same building called Confucius Plaza. The only condition is we will interview the patient. I said, oh. What kind of deal in the world? I never even explained that, you know. 
So I said, okay, I take it. So he gave me the place free and sent me the patient. And that time I teach all the Chinese pe people there. That publication was called Reports of the National Clearing House of Meditation and, and Relaxation. It's a compilation of the personal experience of Master Chair's students, and most of them were also my patients or my personal friends. I was not expecting to find what I found in the interviews. Those interviews convinced me that the microcosmic orbit is a basic part of human physiology as basic as the cardiovascular system. I met Chi originally through uh, a teacher I was working with in New York, uh, Don An, who was a, a Tai Chi teacher and a Qigong teacher, South Korean. Uh, he had been one of the early students of Chen Man Ching, a famous Tai Chi master of this era. I'd been working with, with Don for a year or so, and uh, his teaching began to change. He began to introduce some new ideas some Taoist alchemy principles and formulas and so on, and I became curious as to uh, where this came from because they weren't part of his teaching system when I first began with him. It was something new that he had added. I met Don in 1978 and started studying Tai Chi with him then. I learned a long form, I learned some Qigong, he did a practice called primal breathing, and towards the end of that period it became apparent that Don was studying with someone else because we started noticing that his teaching had changed a little bit. So I inquired of him uh, as politically as I could at the time, and uh, he revealed that he had been working with a teacher named Mantak Chia, who had a small studio office down in, uh, in the Bowery, in the edge of Chinatown. One day, Don, I walked in. He said, I want to learn your system. He said, there are many levels. He's very religious. He come every day. Nobody like him. I come every day. He learns so fast. And that time I finished the book and he held me beside the cover. Don made the first drawing of the microcosmic man. Yes, because Don was a really good artist. He was well known in the art world for his art. He did beautiful paintings of tigers and calligraphy and he did beautiful stuff. I picked up a copy of his self-published book, Awakened Healing Energy, and I read it and I was very impressed and, and really impressed with all of the esoteric information that was being revealed at that time. And suddenly, Gunther called. Gunther study said, my God, now I find the source. I want to study with you. And I said, like this, okay, how about like this? I don't want to get conflict with Don An. We're a good friend, okay? So he said, okay, we make a workshop in his center, it's in, in the Soho. Don An, who not only was a Tai Chi teacher, but a great artist, he had ads in the newspaper, The Village Voice, and he said, presenting Montauk Chia. This was happening somewhere in between 80 and 81. In Don An's studio, we felt good feelings for each other, and we thought the information was phenomenal. There was nowhere else to find something like this. It was a two-day workshop. We spent two full days opening the orbit. It was like I was catapulted into another dimension. You know, I really started experiencing chi flow. And it was like, it was miraculous to me. It was like, oh, this is what, what people are talking about. Well, after Montauk Chia's workshop, and I opened my microcosmic orbit after a few practices, I was sold because I'd never really felt chi. So this was it for me, and I had heard about Taoism only a few months before all that. It was a miracle that I happened to see that ad, and I went to the free workshop and signed up for the weekend, and the rest is, you know, her story. After that experience, uh, I and I think all the other people who took the workshop ended up starting to study with Montauk Chia. We are working with one force in the universe, but in a different way. 
And I believe that the Taoism have the most practice to feel the force in the universe. One thing led to another, and we uh, actually invited Master Chia to come to Cambridge to teach. We had hosted him, and we had our first seminar at the Harvard School of Education. We rented a space there. And I think we probably had maybe 40, 50 people at that first program, uh, almost filled the room. And that was the beginning of my, uh, you know, my relationship with him. So Kanter started to teach me how to organize the uh, workshop, which I never know how to do. In Chinatown, I did one-to-one -one basis, okay, for five years, one-to-one -one basis. You know, he had like a private office in this space, and the people would be meditating out here, and he would go from his little office in to the bigger space and, and do the little tapping and open up a center, and then he would go back, and then he would come back. And so it was all one-to-one -on, one -one work, and he really started doing classes after the workshop at Don's. From there, I learned how to run workshop, and that became my life. <laughs> okay, workshop every day. <laughs> esoteric underground. I was doing a lot of intense Kundalini yoga, which was totally underground, 1978, 79, 80. And I had a small circle of friends who were always on the lookout for other esoteric things happening, which again was not at all common at the time. And one of my friends, Donna Bubash, started telling me about this guy who was doing this intense iron shirt packing practice, and I had no idea what it was. I was taking a Tai Chi class with Sharon Smith, and she announced in the middle of the class, well, I'm canceling the class because I don't think anybody should be doing Tai Chi without first learning the microcosmic orbit. I said, what's the orbit? I said, well, come on down to Chinatown if you want to meet this guy. I met uh, Mon Tai Chi and uh, went down to Chinatown. I asked him what he was about. He says, I'm teaching physical immortality. I said, oh, really? That was a new one for me. And uh, so, of course, it piqued my curiosity, and I was kind of a know-it-all, and it means I had to know everything he knew also. Because <laughs> at that time, of course, you know, there wasn't very much on anything published, really. So people were digging around trying to find stuff that's, you know, explain the cosmos. You have to understand, everything was still underground. None of this stuff had gotten big. You know, yoga was still banned in all the churches, and it was like a weird cult. I mean, yoga. Okay, you just can't imagine the mindset back then. You got to go back 25 years. That was a weird Eastern thing. In the February of 1972, Richard Nixon made the historic China trip. Met with Ch Chairman Mao, Premier Chao and China started to open up to the West. Before that visit, the US government, Congress, and the media stereotyped and profiled the Chinese people as communists and yellow pavil. Since after that visit, the American people gradually loosened up their fears and began to explore what that mystical Chinese people is all about. Very soon, the American people began to discover that the Chinese people have a 5,000-year-old history of peaceful, humanist, and spiritual culture much more profound than the British and the European culture. The empire where the sun never sets, the British Empire, conquered, colonized, and ruled every land of the world and encircled the globe. However, the British, British never colonized China. 
because the British realized they were so tiny in front of this spiritual giant, China. The next 10 years, the American people try to discover everything they can about the more realistic aspects of Chinese culture, like ping pong, martial arts, silk printing, the Chinese culinary arts, the Chinese language, calligraphy, herbal medicine, and acupuncture. By 1980, Americans are ready to discover the spiritual and esoteric aspects of Chinese culture. Kung Fu Zi, Confucius, Lao Zi, Zhuang Zi, and the Tao Esoterica. Actually, a lot of spiritual and, and esoteric practices had already taken root in America in the 1960s and 1970s, introduced from India. Master Che introduced the Chinese Taoist esoteric teachings to America and integrated it all with the esoteric schools already in America at the time. Master Che is a real professor. He's not just a teacher of one esoteric school. He integrated them all. My master name is Master Ying. That means one cloud hermit. One cloud hermit. So it's a Yi Yun Dao Si, one cloud. So he originally come from the White, White Mountain, that near the Manchuria, near the border. It's quite cold. So a lot of in the alchemy practice, they go to that area because it's cold. And you go to the mountain, now it's warm. Under the, the cave in the mountain, it's warm. And so you don't have much any insect or anything there. He himself spent 30 years in all Tao temple and searching for this higher practice. They just teach them how to chant and this and that, and Tai Chi and Qigong and everything. And he said, no, I, I, after a while, I said, no, I don't want. I want more higher level, like inner alchemy, something like that. So after 30 years, he met one old Tao master and said, if you want, you have to go to the mountain. Okay, to find those masters that are willing to teach you. So he left and he go up to the mountain and he learned a lot. In the beginning, he had to carry a lot of food, carry so many things, uh, so heavy, you know. And by the time he go to reach the master that in the cave, it's quite a long walk. The food is run out and they come back. So he learned for a while, he, he lighter and lighter and lighter. And finally, one day he met in the jungle, he met a medicine man. So he talked and said he really will look for the time. He said, oh, I always see them. Sometimes they come down, sometimes they go up, you know. But if you wait, you do like this, you know where to find them. No way. He said, how? You have to learn how to to not carry anything. He said, oh, that is a very good detachment. <laughs> he always have so many things carry on the top, you know. The medicine man in the jungle teach him how to eat the root of the medicine. So you find the root and eat some root and drink some dew, that's it, you know. So you have to do that. You practice and do this first before you're going to find them. Otherwise, you, you know where to find them. You're always running out of food and you go back and run back food. You're never going to find them. So he said, oh yeah, so he learned that. So he, from that time, he just get rid of everything, just that. And I said, go anywhere, he get a route and do practice, and he go up, he continue. And he met quite a few masters in the cave. He sit and wait, sit and wait, they don't come back. So sometimes you don't know they come back or not, you know. So I go and go to other masters and finally come to the, the grandmaster that we're doing here. So um, the grandmaster, no name. He don't want to be named. He get to one level, he go out, he, he leave the body, go out. So, um, and he sit there and started to, so he learned something that he think that some of them are so much dust, all covered with dust. So he started to brush them and everything and massage it a bit. And, uh, and suddenly the grandmaster opened the eye 
He said, oh, you're doing a good job for me, huh? <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, it's interesting. So you, you want to come to learn? He said, yes, that's what I'm waiting for so long. You know? I've been traveling for 10 years now and looking for people. So he said, I think you and me have a good karma. And I think that um, I want to teach you because this is my last time I'm going to come back. So after finish this, I don't come back anymore. So he passing down and stayed with him a few years and actually teaching. And he just take, and he just take care of his body and, and just practice in the cave. One day he came down to the village to buy some simple thing, and the Japanese come in, so he cannot get out. He cannot go back. He sleep on a tree, and when he, he, he go up to sleep on a tree, the next day he wake up, all the all the Japanese camping down there. So he just stay there, and the Japanese ja camping there seven days. Right? Good that he practice not eating. So um. Otherwise, you you hungry seven day and you have to use marble movement. You have to to so you read, you know? so you can just uh, stay up there for seven day until the Japanese move up. And he tried to go back, all area Japanese taking. So he followed the Chinese army all the way to it. So the one that retreat to Hong Kong, eh, to to Taiwan, and he go back to he go to Hong Kong. So that's how I met him. I study in the school and I study with him. That time I am 14, 14, 15, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, yeah. and I go back to Thailand. Well, I was living in San Francisco eh? uh, during the 70s. I come back from India, and um, I was doing the martial arts, the Chinese things, and the Tai Chi with a very good teacher. And I was involved with the whole Chinatown. I was living right next to Chinatown, San Francisco. I was involved with the whole Chinatown and seeing the Chinese. I was living in the Chinese world, you know. And uh, in Chinatown, in New York, or in San Francisco, whenever anybody shows up that, that has one hair of knowledge, yeah. uh, the rumor spreads around among the circle of the people who are really into the things, right? So then we heard there was this guy in New York uh, who teaching meditation. What? Chinese guy teaching meditation? Because in San Francisco, uh, back then in the martial art world, I have been there for several years, um, once in like five, six years, you will hear that his teacher is teaching his main student a meditation. He said, wow, how lucky, fortunate, falling from heaven. And so then we hear these guys running around in New York City teaching Chinese meditation. Okay. Uh, because Tibetan meditation was available, Japanese meditation, Hindu, but not Chinese. Nobody was teaching Chinese meditation openly or even close. In Chinatown in San Francisco, there used to be a store, and I used to go there. We used to bring all the books from Communist China. So then one time, uh, I was down there looking at things, and I see this book, the white cover book, the first book, right, in the corner, you know, awaken uh, something. And I started looking at this, and that's it. I read the book sitting there. I said, boy, this must be the guy who's running around in New York City teaching anything. This is 82, in the summer of 82. And I was planning to go back to India, to my teachers over there. Yeah, I have been passing through San Francisco to learn all this Kung Fu that I wanted to learn, and the Tai Chi. And I was on the way back. And I was going to leave back to India in um, that winter, in the, in the autumn or winter, I was going to go back. You know? So this was, I think, was in summer, uh, I don't know, June or July. And I had all, every, almost everything ready. I was just finishing one style, the last style my teacher was teaching. And that's it, I'm leaving. And then I come across this thing. I said, okay, I'm going to go to New York, check out this guy, right? 
And just when I made that decision, uh, in one of these free newspapers that they have in, you know, in the, back then in the New Age uh, circle, it's a little ad, tiny ad, you know? But it mentioned the name of the guy, which I knew from the book. Man, I said, boy, I'm going to go see that guy. So then um, I got there early, because I was really interested. And the, the, the place, nobody was there yet. The, room, the door was closed. You had to wait outside. And five minutes later comes him and uh, Gunter Wilde, because it was a Gunter's sabbatical year. A lot of his work I learned uh, basically traveling with him, staying in hotel rooms, and he would write a little formula on the back of an envelope, like the Gettysburg Address. <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would study the, you know, the fusion or the microcosmic, you know, because he would just scribble it on a little piece of paper, and I would practice it, and I'd ask him, and, and I'd learn the Tai Chi form kind of traveling, and that was my... Uh, that was how I began to learn. So then Gunter was a guy who could talk and fluently. Chia's English was not understandable. So then Gunter will do the introduction. So then, well, okay, so they come to the door, and, uh, and of course, the room you open, there was no chairs, nothing. And what a rush, because they, um, they had said 7 o'clock, and now it's like, you know, 10 to 7, and the room had nothing. So then um, I begin to help this guy with the chairs and all this stuff, you know. And then back then, I was already working for some time with uh, signs and omens. You know, like, uh, you know, accept the sign, be aware of this. You know? So I'm we're rushing with these chairs, Gunter, Chia, and me. And I catch myself, and I talk to myself, I'm already helping this guy. Watch. That's why I said, watch. <laughs> and we put in the chair, and he says, put the chair over here, put the chair over there. Okay, so, so we put in the chair, and the people start coming. Okay, the hardcore guys, we're all martial art guys that I knew from, you know, had seen them around San Francisco or I knew them person. All young guys, mostly guys, you know. And then the room gradually filled up and it was like, um, I would say 300 people. It was a big room, huh? So then this was like, I don't know, 7.30 we start and Gunter does introduction. Very fluent, very professional. We want to see the guy do something, you know. So then Gunter is talking, talking, yeah, yeah. But then, uh, and then Chia starts, and we can hardly understand anything. And, and then Gunter is kind of uh, translating, sort of like saying, uh, because, uh, it, it's this thing, you know, it, it's that thing. You know? And then, um, uh, see, this thing was totally on a structure. It was very enthusiastic, you know. So then he's talking this. And he jumped into that subject, jumped into another subject. And eventually, the thing, he gets up, uh, you know, he's standing up, and he says, push me. So then all these guys got up and pushed the guy. I said, wow, they got Punch me, <laughs> punching the guy. And then this thing's like a circus, okay? And this was like 11.30 in the evening already, and we're still there, and he's taking the, sh the jacket off and, <laughs> and all these things. And this is on end, he said, wow. Uh, and we're having a great time, eh? because it's like no, no Chinese does this in Chinatown or anywhere. Every, every Chinese was very suspicious, very reserved. Western people, they just, you know, a drop of anything. And this guy is just pouring out any information you want. <laughs> we can't believe this guy, you know? So then we stay there until the end, and then walk away, some of my friends, and they say, wow. We start discussing, this guy, or he's for real, or he's a total fake, okay? But uh, who is this guy? We don't come back tomorrow to see this boy. What's he gonna do? When I studied in Hong Kong, study the Chinese and the English. One day we eating outside and talking. The novel talk about kung fu fighting, internal chi energy. We don't believe that. You know? So a man walk by, come in. He said, "You don't believe chi? My master can show you the energy." He said, "If you want, I can bring you to see him." Huh? So I said, "Yes, I want." You know? So we have seven people sitting together. It's all Thai people that go to study. So we said, okay, tomorrow, 10 o'clock, we go. And after that, tomorrow, I'm the only one there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I go, <clears throat> I go with, um, with him to study. And um, I took to see the master, and the master looked at there. Uh, he said, where is the another seven people? I said, they said they're going to come, and they don't come. So, so he said, oh, so it's good. So you're the only one people come, he said. So he looked at me. So I said, yes. So um, he said, you want to feel energy? Yes. So I said, um, so you concentrate. And he put a finger on, yeah, you concentrate here. Keep on concentrate. You feel something, you come back and tell me. So I go home and meditate and meditate and meditate. And I feel heat inside. And it started to running, heat. 
The heat started to come and grow more and grow more. And uh, I sit near the whole night. And the second day, my energy moved. So I go to see him. He said, oh. So I explain to him that I feel like this. I said, oh, it's very quick, you know. So it's uh, exceptional. That's good. So um, And he started to teach me. I'm going to be introducing Master Mantak Shia. What he teaches is called Taoist Esoteric Yoga. Master Chia, Hi. it's good, good to, see to see you here today. The name of Tao Esoteric Yoga is, mean that the Taos have been existing in the world about 8,000 years, that the, the history they said. And about 3,000 years ago, the Indian master called Bodhidharma came over to China and bring the Indian Kundalini system. So the Tao's genius and the Kundalini system of the Indian married and become the Tao's esoteric yoga. A marriage, eh? Marriage. There are um, many people who um, think that this is kind of spooky and that they can't relate to it. They think that meditation is something that's mystical and they say that they can't meditate. How do you think that the Western people can fit any kind of meditation into their lives. If the, um, the way that the meditation that we are teaching now is the, te is the way that we call calm yourself, or we, we have another name to say that conserve the energy. The same thing is that our body have a connecting tissue we call a fascia. It works like a balloon. So if you know how to energize the body and collect the energy, or we call the storage the energy, store the energy Store inside. the energy. So you have a cushion of protecting yourselves. If you have a little bit of practice, energize the body, strengthen the organs, strengthen the tendon and the fascia, you can protect yourself from a lot of unexpected injury. When I first started to refer my patients and personal friends to Master Chair, I did not know that he is so gifted that he was able to pass on this ancient knowledge using modern scientific terms explanations and imagery, particularly the medical aspects of science. I provided him the medical terms and the medical database, but he soaked it all up. And when it came back out of his mouth as he, as he teaches, this ancient art of Taoist practices flow right out of him like he's a professor of medicine teaching the medical sciences. So basically all the people knew were martial arts. That was the only thing they'd gotten through. There were some Tai Chi, a few Tai Chi teachers at the time. That was it. And uh, so there's no context where this really is a spiritual or medical path. That wasn't out there available yet. It was a weekend when I did this class, right? Monday, mon Monday morning, I go back to my studio with my teacher. I had the keys to open, and then uh, my regular Tai Chi teacher, Kung Fu, opened uh, the studio, and I would sweep and, and then get it ready for the people to come. The people who, uh, before going to work, would do they practice and then go to work. So then I open and I begin my practice with the Tai Chi. You know? And then my teacher comes. He sits down. And we're waiting for other people to come, but he's just watching. He says, that's very good. Very, very good. Okay, because my teacher also spoke very little English. Very, very good. And uh, uh, you're doing it with Chi today. Uh, very good, Chi, 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 very good. Very, no, no, no. very, very good, very good. I said, boy. Uh, that stuff uh, that I felt, the energy uh, that I felt this weekend doing the thing, uh, that I'm putting now when I'm doing this movement, my teacher's noticing. Because, the, you know, the thing with him was, no chi, no chi. And then another time I say, with chi, with chi, very good, very good. So the Monday I go back, I know, that, boy, this stuff I learned this weekend, even though I haven't practiced really, I just began, uh, it's working. There's something here, I'm going to investigate this more, and I'm going to postpone my trip find out more about this because um, this is something that I've been looking for, uh, especially the Chinese teachings. You know, I like the Indians and this is something my father is Chinese and I had always this um, um, affection for the Chinese teaching. Chia told me initially one of his interests was uh, that he was going to write a single book about all seven of the uh, Taoist alchemical formulas that he had and that maybe he needed a writer and maybe I, would I be interested. Oh, I thought, oh, we'll see. That sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> uh, it was his driving energy and his desire to keep going and keep publishing more books and you know, keep expanding it. I mean, he was certainly the engine behind it. And I ended up editing, you know, seven books and writing, you know, a good piece of, of those books that I never thought I would do. 
uh, one book is way too much in the seven. <laughs> It wasn't until the uh, Cultivating Male Sexual Energy, Tao Secrets of Love book, which I worked on for, you know, over a year, that that's the book that really took off. Of course, people are interested in sex and spiritual sex, you know, really hot topic, and practical advice on it, super hot. You know, you had a lot of people from all past now are saying, well, this is our big problem. We're not dealing with sex. You know, we don't have anything to do, you know, all these we had celibate Catholics, with everybody, you know, already coming up and saying, wow, I needed this, you know, 20 years ago. And also attracted Barbara Summerfield, who was his first publisher. And published and did a professional job of publishing Awakening and Healing Energy of the Tao, which already produced some controversy because all the Chinese hated him as soon as that book came out. This is the first book that explained the microcosmic orbit. The Chinese felt he was, of course, giving away national secrets. And it made all these other teachers look bad because they would make their inner door students wait five or ten years before they would teach them the orbit. And they had to like train and, you know, kowtow and kiss butt and, you know, promise lifetime allegiance, you know, all the Chinese kind of things before they would teach them just the orbit. And so here we are, we published out this book on it and everyone's reading it for, you know, ten bucks. And of course all the other Chinese are pissed off because now they, they're outed in a sense. He was already controversial, and all the Chinese started accusing him of being commercial. And all the Westerners were saying, wow, this is great, you know, like, finally someone's talking, you know. <laughs> a little bit of openness here, though, that's appreciated. Of course, I'd already read some of the Taoist poetry and stuff like that, but now it started to make sense. And uh, I started to see the inner training and the inner practices, how they match these texts. Before that, it was just like, oh, that's beautiful, mystical poetry, you know, Tao Te Ching, but... What do you do with it? You know, how do you eat that? You know, <laughs> and so like in college, I read all that stuff, and I just you know, tossed it out. Like, you know, another piece of pretty poetry. I had a dear old friend for many years in the grid Jeff work, uh, Felix Morrow. I think he was in his early 80s. I hadn't seen him for many years, and he had commented on how much he thought I had changed. My body had changed. And I was sharing with him a lot of the work I was doing in Qigong and Tai Chi and that how the very positive effects that it had, and he became interested. So I brought him into the fold, and he brought with him a lot of his know-how in publishing. Felix was the first person to really develop a, uh, the first mail-order esoteric uh, and spiritual book catalog. He had an imprint called University Books. He was a pioneer in, in bringing esoteric and spiritual literature to the public through that imprint. And so he, he came into the fold through me and also organized Chia's first uh, publishing venture. It was really a, it was a collective effort. It wasn't uh, something that Montaché even had a vision of originally. He just kind of evolved out of our interest from a group of us that said, hey, you know, look how electric, eclectic we are. We got someone over here who's uh, a Sufi and this guy's from a Buddhist tradition and this one's doing the yogic and the Hindu tradition. And they had all of these Esotericist, basically, finally had a practical vehicle that seemed to hold together. We didn't know because we hadn't gone to all the higher levels of it, but the foundation was fabulous. And, you know, just immediately started attracting and generating like a magnet, all this interest from all these people in different directions. So then when I brought the, uh, the posters, the, the, the sketches of the posters, and, and he had the enthusiasm, I also offer, which was really honest, I said, um, if you need any pictures for your classes, any illustrations, I'll be happy to do them. Okay, so I like to work closer with this person and get him to know him at the other level. So he said, yes, I have these books, I have many books in, in, in preparation. I said, boy, I like that. I like to work in books. When the uh, women's sexual book came out, uh, we thought, this is going to be a book, a big book because uh, the male book had come out already. But, uh, you know, we had this feeling, you know, and the feeling turned out to be right because the book came out in the stores and uh, when the first workshop was being done in Chinatown, again, the same room as always, 
we arrived, you know, I arrived with him, Manny Juan, uh, Maxi in the car, and this is a bunch of people downstairs in the sidewalk, which I know, this, this room was upstairs, you know, the second floor. There's all these people on there, they said, what's, what's happening, what's happening? And there was a line of people to sign up. This had never happened before. We had like 25 people, and they hardly fit in the room, you know, we were like, <laughs> everybody was like nervous, like, what is this, <laughs> you know? I heard about the Tao about three years before I met Montak Chia, and a friend of mine gave us a book, Awaken Healing Energy Through the Tao, and he said, I think this will help you. So we flew down to San Francisco, and we were very impressed uh, by his energy and his uh, presentation of the, how progressive these practices are. Meeting with Marsha Kerwin, she was uh, writing the book, The Healing Love Through the Tao, which became a bestseller. And I love that, that whole practice of breast massage and awakening the inner organs and the virtues of the organs. And I bought my first jade egg from Marsha. The jade egg became like a lifelong love affair with the cultivating sexual energy because we urgently need those practices to uh, integrate our sexuality with our spirituality and with love. The female practices that Master Chia brought to the West are essential practices for life. And women of all ages can benefit from these practices, not just in their sexual life, but in their emotional life and in their life as citizens of the universe. It's really about doing them not about talking about them. You do it, and you get it, and you don't do it, and you don't get it. <laughs>
from the acupuncture I felt healthier it took about a year and I felt like a new person but I went a lot to the acupuncture so I said to myself what else can I do to help my health what else can I contribute what can I do and someone said take a Tai Chi course try it you might like it and it may help you so I signed up for the Tai Chi class at Interface they were teaching Tai Chi and meditation and I said no, I'm not the meditative type I'll go for the Tai Chi and after a while the Tai Chi helped me just relax my nervous system and I was able to sit and meditate and enjoy it and amazingly the Tai Chi, the Qi Kung, the meditation techniques my allergies disappeared and I felt the power in that I felt the power of self-healing at this point in time it's my late 20s <laughs> I'm going through my Saturn return I'm going through a lot of change in my life so finding the Tao was perfect I needed centering I needed guidance I needed a path I needed a way so Tai Chi gave me this and it was exciting you know Buddha Palm Qi Kung Tai Chi fast form Tai Chi slow form Tai Chi long form um, microcosmic orbit you know it was everything I was interested in so here was the whole package healing martial arts Taoism the philosophy uh, a way of being with people intimately sharing energy in meditation it was just you know a, a big awakening first retreat in Andover there must have been 50, 60 people we did fire walking at the time Tony Robbins was doing fire walks and Master Chia decided to incorporate that it was self-empowering it was personal growth it was another tool I started studying the Tao it was the 80s this was Star Wars it's like Harry Potter today but back then it was Star Wars and the force and Master Chi is saying you can connect to the force now this was something I was interested in <laughs> up at Big Indian you know when I was assisting I would sit next to Master Chia and lead the meditation and he would be over there connecting to the force and directing Chi 
like a beam of energy across the room to about a hundred people at Big Indian. There were a lot of people that came in those days. You know, the teacher trainings were an important time, an inspirational time, you know, my buddies. We worked hard, we trained hard. And this community helped give me the strength, the courage to do the teacher training. I was interested in learning and sharing. Montachia for the first time came to Germany to a congress and we all went there and saw him. I was especially attracted to it because of the body work. In the end of 1985-1986 a very dramatic thing happened in my personal life, a loss of, uh, of my spiritual mother and I knew I had to do something extraordinary and I knew I wanted to do more intensive training in the Taoist work and I thought I wanted to go to America. At that time, to, uh, to buy a dollar, I had to give four D marks. That meant I had to work four times as hard as any American <laughs> to come up with one dollar. Because it kind of equal what you made in one D mark, you know, you make a dollar. So I, I sat down and make a calculation uh, if I could go to the, to the training in, in Big Indian. And it actually, number-wise, it wasn't possible. What I made in my, in my physical therapy and working in a hospital, uh, what my income was, with flight and everything, not possible. And I thought, I'm going to do this. So I just started selling stuff. I worked. I taught the healing sounds and the inner smile in the evening from having had one workshop with Mantak Chia because I was living in a, in a meditation center in a commune with people and they were all interested. So I worked like crazy and I knew I was going to do this. And I had, uh, this was, I think I made the plan in February and the training was, uh, the summer retreat was in July. And everything fell into place. A girlfriend bought me the plane ticket. Another friend signed me a check. And everything just worked. And then I went there. I went to Big Indian. Meeting Juan, I became part of the family. That same summer with Juan, I met Ron. And I met them as a team. <laughs> uh, every weekend, there was this day off between the retreats, and that's when Ron came with his Cadillac, <laughs> three, seating three, and it was the three of us going scouting the neighborhood, going to this Tibetan monastery or some, some, Indian, some Indian ashram. I mean, everything you, you look for, it's up there in the Catskill Mountains, right? To be with Ron was fun. We both, of course, also shared the passion in body work. That was another thing where we were really close. And I think it was in the second year when Master Chia lost his voice and it was left to us to teach the Chi Tsang class. We were kind of dumped in there. It was Ron, Shanti and me having to kind of uh, come up <laughs> with, this, with this whole class. And it was one of the best Chi Tsang classes <laughs> ever taught, I suppose, because it was just so many, so much input of all these practitioners. So it was really wonderful. I started translating Mantak Chia in every single workshop in, in German-speaking countries, Switzerland, Austria, Germany. That was actually the most intense time in the, in the work with Master Chia in, uh, in Europe because we had these huge classes in Switzerland. With, I remember, I think probably three years after that, we had a Kun and Lee with a hundred people. I mean, we were steaming, yeah. <laughs> really steaming. The Tao just has become a way of life to me. It's not any more practices I do or techniques I, I practice, but it's really a lifestyle that I uh, have the pleasure of sharing. I remember getting the certificate at Master Chia's house in Huntington, Long Island, and he had 
left Brooklyn and moved to Huntington, and the Posners were living, they were living in the same house. In 1980, I was a student at New York Chiropractic College, and uh, previous to that, I had studied some Tai Chi Tuan for five years, and five years of Tang Soo Do, which is a Korean martial art, and I got my black belt in that. And I began studying Tai Chi, and when I was in chiropractic school, I just, you know, kind of got out of shape and I lost my connection. So I was looking for a new teacher and I got the whole lifetimes and I saw Taoist esoteric yoga, Master Montag Chia. So I decided to go down to Chinatown with Lois to meet him. When I was graduating from school, I needed a place to live. He was also looking for a house to buy. And I had found a house in Huntington, New York but I couldn't afford it. When it all got down to it, I didn't have credit because I just graduated. So he bought the house. Lois and I moved in with him. And that was uh, the beginning of a long-term relationship to this day. Michael literally dragged me to Chinatown that day. I had no desire to meet Master Chia or do any of these martial arts activities. I had, at that time in my life, done nothing. I led a very sheltered life. I went to Catholic school and I never meditated and I tried Tai Chi once, I thought it was ridiculous. And so when I saw the poster, Taoist Esoteric Yoga, I wanted to tear out of there because it terrified me. Just the words scared me and I was afraid what we were getting into. Well, I of course put my trust in Michael and I'm very grateful that I did because we met the most kind-hearted man, Master Chia, that you could ever imagine. He sat down and spoke to us, and it was very difficult for me to understand him in the beginning. It took me a long, long time. So he convinced us to take the seminar, and of course, I thought, okay. I um, sat down in that first seminar and had the most amazing experience, which, if you'd like me to tell you that now, I will. They, they had been going around the class, and at the first break, Mike Wynn and Sharon Smith, they were talking about their experiences of how they saw energy moving inside and saw bells and whistles and lights and stars, and I saw black, I saw sludge, I saw nothing, I felt nothing but blackness inside, and I felt like this wasn't for me, and Master Chia, I told him that, and he said, you no worry. You just do it. You get it. So we came back to the you know, meditation circle, and he put his hand at my sacral area, the lumbosacral area, and there blew out like a giant-sized balloon that felt like it came out of my spine. And I wanted to turn around to look at it, but Master Chia gently nudged me back to stay in the posture. And I was astonished. I couldn't imagine that I even had that in me. And then he tapped my head and it went up. And later he tapped my forehead and it went completely down and around. And he winked at me. And I, from that moment on, realized that there was something inside of me that I had to work at. And it took me a year to be able to actually break through that blackness and see the white light. And I many times despaired hearing other people's stories, comparing myself to other people, learning in the process from Master Chia not to compare, to just go within and, and just do it. And if I heard that once, I heard it a thousand million times, just do it, you get it. So I eventually got it and, you know, I stuck with it and at the, I was at the point where I can, you know, now see the energy and feel it with my eyes open and I'm very grateful. And back then in those days, when he would do the microcosmic, he would go around to each person. She would go around each person and um, massage the sacrum, tap the spine and then press really hard the eyelids. <laughs> you know, the eyes, sink them in, you know, and tap the, head, the crown really hard, you know. And, and in the class that we took, the basic class, the first class with him, we were around 40 people. 
So then when he got done with the, with the last guy, we've been sitting there waiting for like an hour and a half, you know? And a couple of guys have passed out. Because this thing was so strong, he presses it and pushes here and down the head that some people couldn't take it. And then you faint, pass out. I said, boy, this stuff is tough. One, two guys on the floor. <laughs> I'm coming next. He's coming my way. In the beginning, when we, you know, first moved in with Master Chia, Maniwan actually helped me a lot. I had an ovarian cyst, and with her remedies and her herbs, we were able to alleviate that. I got pregnant while we were living at Master Chia's house, and I had the great honor of being under their, you know, mini supervision while I was pregnant. And of course, Christy, our firstborn, you know, got a direct benefit of that. And I did Tai Chi up until the day I delivered Christy. And you taught the uh, Inner Smile in the public school. Oh, I taught it to the kindergarten kids, the first grade kids. I taught it to my Girl Scout troop, my Cub Scout troop. You know, just keep spreading it to the little ones because they're the future. I was down in Huntington, New York at Master Chia's house and that was where the teacher training that I did was held. And in exchange for doing um, work on the books, because I was at the time a graphic designer, illustrator, and I was able to barter for part of the time of being able to basically spend the whole uh, month with Master Chia. Spending that time there, getting it coordinated, was just amazing. We had Maniwan making wonderful meals. It was just, it was a really magical, magical time. One of the, my favorite things about living at Master Chia's house was the guests that he had from all over the world. I think absolutely my most favorite was meeting Wan Lee, the awesome artist. I mean, his paintings preceded him, and I actually got to see him painting in the act of doing it, which was marvelous. <laughs> in that fusion practice was the first time I did the fusion. I think it was the first time he taught in San Francisco, no? Um, you know, sit down, it was, the, you know, the regular thing, the pacuas, the, the uh, cauldron. And when we got to the part where we are doing the spiral and to make the first pearl, right? Uh, something broke loose. I, I actually held like a crack. It was like, you know? And the solar plexus or something opened. The solar plexus because um, tremendous hunger came. I mean, hungry, I could eat anything. I stopped the meditation. I started looking under the chair to see if anybody has a cookie, a bag with anything, <laughs> anything to drink, anything to put in the stomach. Nobody has anything, you know, because it was dinner. It was evening. Nobody brings cookies, you know, so. But what happened when that thing cracked in the, um, the, the cauldron in there was that I saw um, the posters of the fusion that later on I'm going to paint. I saw it was clear. It was like a, it was like somebody showed me a, a photograph, uh, and I knew Tibetan painting already from before, you know. So then I saw this thing. Uh, oh, that's what I'm going to paint. Since I was going to, to go to India, and I didn't have plan to stay in San Francisco, I left the, um, the house I was sharing with somebody else, and I headed for Mexico to practice, you know, to find a place where I could uh, practice and draw the posters for me, because eh? these practices I've been learning, and I already knew the smile, the healing sound, the microcosmic, you know, the healing love, right, and the fusion one. So I headed down to Mexico. And my idea was to find a place close to the border with California, and not to go deep into the, the whole Mexican mess, right? <laughs> I found a nice house, wonderful house, in the countryside, in the mountains, and finished the rest of the posters. Because when I came back from Mexico with the, uh, the, the little posters I had drawn for me, to put in the room on the wall and, and, and sort of you know, get the information there, uh, I had noticed that when I had those posters hanging on the wall, and I walked into the room with the mind distracted, I would be sort of uh, inspired to practice, to sit there and practice. It was like, I want to practice.
we were beginning to coordinate doing the books. They're so amazing. I used to just love to look at them. They had copies of them up at all the retreats. And, you know, they helped so much. Uh, I think especially for people who, you know, I mean, to just even... A lot of this practice, you do have to have a, a kind of a good mental focus because <laughs> I think that's one of the things it gives you, but it also, you know, you have to hold it. And to have the picture makes such a difference in helping the energy flow. So then when I went back to New York from Mexico from that experience, I uh, said, I'm going to show this to the teacher, tell him that this stuff has been useful for me to have on the wall. You know, maybe he wants to make photocopies or Xeroxes, you know. If you're going to do these books, they should be two books in one. The uh, person who picks up the book just by flipping should get the practice. Because I knew from my Tibetan teacher, the, the, the painting teacher, that the, uh, the sacred art, which is what I was learning with the Tibetans, what it does is communicate in an instant, not even a second, uh, instantly, the essence of that practice, the experience of that practice, you know, the essence instantly to the unconscious of the, of the, of the viewer, no? So I was coming from that idea that the, 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 um, the medium of uh, visual illustration had to communicate the essence of the practice instantly, you know? And of course the posters were done in that spirit, but then the idea was also um, the books that were going to have uh, illustration should have everything put in pictures. So when you flip through it, you got the essence of the practice, and now you read the text and get the detail. And then you meet the teacher eventually and get the transmission. I had learned from my Tibetan teachers also that uh, when you are attracted to a teacher and you find the teaching interesting uh, or useful, uh, you have to, and you're committing yourself to work with this person, you know, you have to uh, research who this person truly is. Not only now that you're receiving teachings, but now you have to investigate the teacher, all right? So then uh, the more time I was spending uh, with the practices, I developed the desire, okay, I like this guy, I like the teaching, I'm getting results. Who is this person who's doing this? Okay. Does he practice? Does he live like this? How he has integrated these things in his daily life? Not in the workshop, in his ordinary setting with his family, whatever, his friends or whatever. The Traditionally, the Chinese really have taught always in a family setting where the trust and intimacy and mutual help is part of the, the, the setting. It's not money. Actually, money is not really the, the object. It's really trust and that somebody's really become part of a family and is somebody who, is, who has excellent qualities. So it's equal benefit that is taking place. I'm 53 now, and so um, I was a, a boy in the early 1960s, and um, any boy growing up in the United States would have known all about uh, the Green Hornet. And the Green Hornet was a television show. And although the star was Spencer so-and-so, the real star of the whole show was a character whose name was Cato. And Cato was played by Bruce Lee. And all the boys my age would watch that show, and the next day and through the weekend, we would, we would replicate Cato's martial arts moves, which couldn't be replicated anywhere. And it was with that that I really began to be curious and want to know all about this way of f both fighting and living, because it was quite clear that Bruce Lee was living something, even off stage, even off camera, that this was a person who wasn't really just acting. There was a fire generated from the kind of energy that he, that you could see even on television when he's playing a character. Through Master Chi and the people who came, of course, I met Marie and many of the other um, players uh, in Boston. They were just embodying the one teacher, and the one teacher had had me in his in her grasp for since I was a child. I had spent a full ten years, you know, developing all of this. And I'm the kind of person that I learn if I teach what I learn. Once I have some mastery of it, I easily sort of share it with people. And so that was part of what I was doing in inviting Marie to teach classes, because then in the aftermath of those classes, I had students, and I was beginning then to teach them. 
and, and share what I knew, sort of on the authority of, of the other instructors. In 1994, I went to the instructor's training retreat that he had, he had been having in the United States, and I knew that I better catch the train now or I'll have to go to Thailand, and that'll be harder on my family. And it was the last month that Master Chia um, would, would provide that in the United States. And so it was at Vassar that I was able to spend much more time with Master Chia and with the other instructors. At that time, many of these senior instructors, because they're now were, he'd been around long enough to have senior instructors, and had their own kind of reputations, either because they were, they were experts at opening the microcosmic or breath work, or um, Ron Diana was, was reputed to have an iron shirt you know, form in root that couldn't be budged. And so during the testing of my iron shirt form, Master Chia was going around and sort of testing everybody. And Ron and um, another senior instructor were sitting right in front of me, sort of watching. And Ron, grinning as usual, could see that I was getting it, but not getting it. And so, so he went like this, he went like this, you know, and which was just enough of a cue for me to then sort of get that piece, which in the upper structure was, I was, I was forgetting for, for concentrating on other things, you know. And Master Chia came just by at that time. He knew he was coming by around the corner, so he went like this, and Master Chia comes by and tested it, and said, mm, all right. One often passes that way, you know, the grace of the Tao. It was around that time that, of course, the Healing Tao Instructors Association was, was a concept I've been involved with several large international movements over the years where the founder of the movement, the inspiration behind it, um, either had to let go and find a way for his instructors, his followers, to, um, to carry it on while he's alive, you know, or not be able to make that, that jump. And you either make it or you can't, depending on who you are as, as the founder of, you know, a movement. And, um, and I've seen that successfully done and I've seen it fail. It was in 1994 that Master Chia announced that he was going to be living at the Tao Garden and that the Healing Tao Instructors Association was forming. And, you know, we're North Americans and principally Americans and we have our ways of of understanding the way we're going to handle our organization. And we don't do it um, dynastically, and we don't do it as one would perhaps with the genius of a Southeast Asian. We're, we're pretty egalitarian and democratic. And so um, Master Chia had the freedom and um, the liberation to I'll be able to approve that, to be able to say, you guys do that, and let that go, um, and have an autonomous, interconnected instructors association that had its own power, had its own authority unto itself. Um, and that's a difficult thing for most masters um, um, to accomplish, most leaders, whether they're CEOs of companies or, or, or what, it really doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, but in a spiritual organization, perhaps it's, it's, it's even more difficult because the sort of the shadow underneath one's practice is always there. And so, um, fear and competition and, um, jealousy can move up quite easily, um, and take precedence. So, um, and it can be very destructive. So, uh, you know, a lot of the health of the organization is, is, is due to that inception, um, of his liberation and his freedom to be able to say, I trust you, and to let go and, and let that happen. At that time when he was making this transition, he allowed it to continue just through the vulnerability of trusting and letting go. And that gave great power to the new senior instructors, among whom Marie Favorita was, was, was named around that time. You know, it was just one of those things that, that starts. So you get new growth and new life. Um, as a result, we were both 
um, founding board members of the Healing Tao Instructors Association. And so we would meet once or twice a month for board meetings, and they would be bridge, phone bridge meetings. Ron and Diana would always be uh, one of several people who added this root and this weight and this anchor uh, to our discussions and to the decisions we were making, helping them to be grounded in a way. It gave, gave weight to what we were doing, um, gave wisdom to it. And Ron would always be on the other end of the phone, being very reassuring and always stepping in and making a, a, a suggestion or a recommendation that, that, would, that people would, would go with. And it was the most helpful thing for coherence and keeping a board of very diverse, far-flung members, you know, uh, together and on track. And because of his history with the Healing Tao, too, there was, you know, he, he and others carried the memory of this history, too. He expressed the Tao in a very particular way that was very profound and very simple. And one of the things that he said that I always loved was, be like a weed not like a hothouse flower, because a weed can grow anywhere. And a hothouse flower needs, you know, all these special foods and herbs and, you know, this sort of fragile, like the princess and the pea kind of thing. And if you're like a weed, you can mutate, you can grow anywhere. Good health has to do with your ability to transform whatever it is you're involved with. And then, of course, all those people from the initial group, we were family. Nice to get together and, uh, you know, it feels easy, comfortable. So then that was some of the pleasure we had when we had that first retreat in Sedona, 95. We're all there, by ourselves, with our uh, chia in the middle where you kind of feel more constricted, you know? Here we could play freely and it was a wonderful retreat, very nice. It's like the best retreat. focus more on growing, uh, keeping the community together here in the States together, and healing down, instructors association strong, training more instructors. Because I realized, uh, you know, the only reason I was able to get in, someone, you know, took the time to teach, and create a structure and a place to, you know, to go learn, and I had so many great experiences, and I thought, well, you got to give something back. Through passing on the torch of these practices and certifying uh, instructors, they carry the torches into their communities and it had this beautiful rippling effect where I felt that we uh, became like a spiritual family and a supportive community that upheld these very powerful um, practices and brought them out into the world. Everyone needs more energy, wants more energy. Learn about Qi, life force, and, and build your dreams, you know, accomplish your goals. You need lots of energy. We live in a very fast-paced society. We live with a lot of distraction. Learn to focus and build your chi, your ki, your prana, your mana, your life force. It's just a practice and everybody benefits throughout the world without any uh, have to be lead to anything, you know, because they believe on themselves and the force.
Yes, really happy. This is the original T-shirt, 1982, from the first Lesser Connolly retreat. You don't need a gym, you don't need a place. The place is you and the time is now. You do this and this happens. You don't do this, you, you're full of shit. <laughs> you're full of shit, stress and anxiety. I really did not know how to love myself. I really thought that meant to go shopping. Yeah, so then I postponed, I kind of postponed indefinitely this India trip until there's nothing more alive than the life force. So if I get bored with that, then I think it's time to check out. This is the part mm. and then Sarah. So you have a little bit mm. looking at her first. Okay. Right away. Okay. So you really look beautiful. <laughs> you have to work with the force, we have to work with God, walking with God. God within you, she within you.